So let's start considering the first control for the problem at hand. We consider our robot with its full dynamics, the inertial terms, the coriolis and centrifugal term, the gravity terms. And our goal is to uh, regulate, namely to obtain asymptotic stabilization of a desired equilibrium state in the closed loop system. The equilibrium state has indeed a zero velocity and a desired configuration QD. Now we would like to design a control that is able to achieve this task. And we consider for, uh, for the, the moment that uh, the desired controller is of the form uh, u equal kp times qd minus q minus kd q dot. This is uh, what is called a classical PD control with respect to the position error. So a proportional terms with respect to the joint position error and a proportional terms with again kd with respect to the velocity error, so the derivative of the position error, uh, having in mind that QD is a constant, if we take the derivative of the error QD minus Q, uh, we would have QD dot, which is 0, minus Q dot. And so you see that the second term can be rewritten as a de derivative term with respect to the position error, namely the velocity error. Now, indeed, QD may, uh, the desired Q, the QD, may come from kinematic inversion of a desired pose of the end effect, but this is a different story. So at this stage, we have uh, a desired configuration. In this control law, uh, we make an assumption, we will see that this is uh, kind of uh, necessary also, that the uh, uh, two gain matrices are both positive definite, and without loss of generality, we consider them symmetric. Now, the first thing that uh, we would consider is whether this control law satisfies the condition for obtaining an equilibrium uh, in the closed loop that is um, at, the, at the desired configuration. In fact, we see that if we are uh, in the desired state, so if Q is equal to Q desired and Q dot is equal to zero, and we would like to be uh, in this uh, particular state, so the acceleration p double dot should be zero, plugging this control law in the above robot model would give uh, uh, on the left-hand side the zero for the inertial term, zero for the velocity term, and uh, a gravity term which is equal to g of q desired, while on the right-hand side nothing would happen. So, uh, we would have uh, the possibility of regulating eventually only uh, configuration Q desired which zero the gravity term. So this is a quite restrictive condition. And so we will put ourselves for studying the behavior of this simple control law, actually the simplest that you can imagine of uh, in terms of dynamics, uh, in the condition where G of Q is uh, identically zero. In fact, we have a theorem that we're going to prove now that says that in the absence of gravity, so when g of q is identically zero, not just at some configuration, but just vanishes in the model, so the motion occurs at constant potential energy, uh, the desired robot state qd zero, so with zero velocity, is a globally asymptotically stable equilibrium uh, under the given PD joint control law. So, uh, before entering into the proof, uh, it is worth mentioning that uh, despite the highly uh, coupled and nonlinear dynamics of the system, uh, a linear control law like a PD control uh, is able to achieve quite uh, an important result. So, uh, how do we proceed? We will make use, indeed, of uh, the machinery that we have developed in the first part of this lecture, namely the Lyapunov of condition for stability uh, and uh, possibly asymptotic stability, and eventually the use of LaSalle theory. 
So we define the error as qd minus q, and we introduce a Lyapunov candidate. We have already seen that uh, energy argument can be used uh, very often. We have done this for the simple passive pendulum system. Uh, but now uh, we have to take into account that we are introducing also a control action. So this Lyapunov candidate, uh, which is quite natural, and we will see more of this type later on, uh, consists of the first part, which is the kinetic energy of the system. There is no potential energy, because potential energy plays no role. It's constant in this, uh, uh, in this context, because g of q is equal to zero, so this constant may be set to zero equally well. But because we are uh, investigating a generic configuration QD as potential globally asymptotically stable equilibrium, we have to include in this function something that vanishes when we are at the desired configuration and otherwise is always positive. In much the same way as the kinetic energy vanishes when we are at rest and all otherwise is always positive. So we introduce the second term, which is again quadratic. Uh, Kp is the matrix that we are using uh, in the control law. So this, uh, let us uh, show, uh, shows that Kp can be taken symmetric without loss of generality. In fact, it appears inside a quadratic form. Uh, and E is the position error. And Kp is positive definite, so this second term by itself is always positive unless the error in the joint space is zero. So we have a good candidate a function which is always positive except where we would like to be. So in the desired closed loop equilibrium state q equal qd and uh, q dot equal zero. So let's consider now the time derivative of this function. And we will evaluate this time derivative along the trajectory of our robotic system. So the trajectory, uh, the evolution that satisfied the closed loop dynamic equation of the system. Remember that g of q is equal to zero, so this closed loop dynamic equation will be uh, m times q double dot, so the inertia times the acceleration, plus the Coriolis and centrifugal term, equal the PD control. So let's do the derivation first. We have the quadratic term. We have done this computation already once when we uh, looked at the derivative of the total energy of the system and we uh, discovered a nice property which we will use right now. So the first uh, uh, term produces, in fact, two uh, contribution, uh, in fact three, but two are uh, just the same, so when we take the derivative of uh, the velocity on the left side and on the right side, we get uh, the same scalar, so twice this uh, scalar eliminates the factor one over two. So the first term is q dot transpose m q double dot. And then we have the uh, another term, which is the derivative in which we take the derivative only of the um, inertia matrix. So we have one half q dot transpose m dot q dot. For the second term, we have exactly the same symmetry. So there will be twice the same uh, scalar contribution. This uh, eliminates the factor one over two. And uh, uh, kp is constant. So the only remaining term is one in which we take the derivative with respect to time of one of the two uh, error terms, for instance, the second one. So the derivative of uh, E, E dot, because Q desired is constant, is simply minus Q dot, so the last term is minus A transpose Kp Q dot. Now, uh, this is just the time derivative of the function. Uh, we should evaluate this function uh, along the trajectory, so we substitute the model. Uh, Please note that I drop dependence uh, in the inertia term and in the derivative of the inertia term and so on, just for compactness. 
So we have a term which is m q double dot. m q double dot appears also in the model. So uh, we are not substituting yet the control law. So the only other term in the model are the Coriolis and centrifugal term, and we know that we can always factorize this as the product of an ACE matrix as a function of Q and Q dot and Q dot because uh, those velocity terms are quadratic. So we substitute to m q double dot u minus s q dot. Uh, we factor out the q dot transpose in front of these two terms, and we leave the other term untouched. Now there's a, uh, by the principle of conservation of energy, we know that uh, this term, this quadratic term is in the velocity, so one half m dot minus s as a matrix in the quadratic form in the velocities, in fact, m dot minus 2s, this is what we proved, but this is a, just a factor one half in front of this, when put into the quadratic form in velocity, vanishes. And this is, has nothing to do with the fact that m dot minus 2s may be skew symmetric. This is a property that holds no matter which factorization we are using. In fact, our control law does not use at all uh, terms related to the model and in particular to the um, colorless and centrifugal term. So this analysis is independent of what we are going to implement. So these two terms, in fact, vanishes. And this is a big advantage because otherwise we would not know what is the main sign of these terms. So the next step is replacing the control law uh, in, at the place of the U. So U is Kp times E minus Kd Q dot. So the Q dot transpose uh, before the parentheses give rise to the first two terms in this expression while the last term is being untouched. Remember that each of these terms are scalars. So they are equal to their transpose. Uh, in addition, Kp is positive definite and symmetric, so Kp transpose is equal to Kp. So the first and third terms are in fact one opposite to the others once you transpose one of the two. And what is left is minus Q dot transpose Kd Q dot, which by the choice of having uh, the second gain matrix, the Kd, the derivative term, um, positive definite, uh, leads to the fact that uh, this expression is non-positive. So it's uh, negative when Q dot is different from zero and is zero when Q dot is equal to zero. Again, you see that uh, the reason why we have chosen without loss of generality also Kd as a symmetric one is because it appears then in the analysis in a quadratic form, so only the symmetric part really matters. So up to now, we have, uh, in fact, proved only stability. So if we apply uh, the first um, criterion, it says we have found a Lapinov candidate, the, its derivative is less or equal than zero, then the equilibrium, uh, the, one, the, the state that zeroes the Lapinov candidate, is stable. But in fact, this is not the uh, thesis of our theorem, in fact, there is still something to do, in particular by the use of uh, LaSalle theorem. So, uh, noting that uh, B dot is equal to zero if and only if the velocity is zero, we will apply now LaSalle. So, we have to uh, find the largest invariant set of states that is contained in the set of states that zero the uh, derivative of the Lyapunov candidate. And this set of states is made by all possible configuration, not just QD, uh, having associated identically zero velocity. Now, in this uh, set of state, we have to find the largest set, which is invariant. It means that if we start from that set, we remain all the time in that set. 
So it should be a set where velocity is always zero. Otherwise, it's not a subset of those states that zero the derivative of the Lyapunov candidate. Okay. So we have to find the largest possible invariant set with these characteristics. So uh, when q dot is equal to zero, we substitute this into the equation of the closed loop dynamics. So the Coriolis and centrifugal term vanish. Also, the derivative term in the control law vanish. So we are left with the simple dynamics m of q q double dot equal k p times the position error. Since the inertia matrix is invertible, we can isolate always the acceleration and rewrite the, uh, the formula like written on the right hand side. So the acceleration is an invertible, so non-singular matrix, times the position error, which means that if and only if the position error is zero, then the acceleration will also be zero. And so we will stay within uh, the set of state at zero the velocity. So this is an invariant uh, set definition. On the other hand, if the error in position is different from zero, we will have uh, a diff an acceleration different from zero. So in the next instant of time, we will move out of the zero velocity state, which means that uh, if the error is different from the position error is different from zero, we are not in the condition of invariance of an invariant set. So LaSalle tells us that the only possibility for, uh, of convergence is to the set of state that has also zero position error. And therefore, the conclusion of the theorem, as the corollary says, the unique state which is invariant in the set of state that uh, zero is the derivative of the Lyapunov candidate, so that have q dot equals zero is the one with q equal q desired, which means with position error zero as well. And this concludes the proof. It's a very elegant proof. It's also paradigmatic in the sense that uh, later on we will see more and more complex Lyapunov candidate and an analysis, but essentially the principle remains the same. Now, uh, a note, there were no particular specification on the structure of the two gain matrices, Kp and Kd. So they should be positive definite, they can be symmetric. So there is no occlusion to the fact that we can choose them fully diagonal. If we choose a, a diagonal gain matrix Kp and a diagonal gain matrix Kd, respectively the one that multiplies the position error and the one that multiplies the velocity, uh, we obtain what is called the decentralized linear control. So each uh, control command for each joint, so ui, will be just kpi times the error in position at that joint minus kdi, the velocity of that joint. So it's purely local to the joint. There's no need of uh, having any information coming from the rest of the manipulator. But this is a, uh, also an important uh, consideration from the point of view of software. And uh, if you are doing some, uh, let's say, um, maker activity, so you build some kind of uh, robot by yourself, for instance, using a Lego Mindstorm or something like that, uh, this would also help in uh, removing connection within one joint to the other. So each joint receives just the command uh, of desired configuration that it should reach, and all the rest is being done locally. In fact, we can also give a very nice mechanical interpretation to this PD controller. Uh, and this is particularly true if we assume that KP and KD are uh, diagonal matrix, although although uh, something similar could be uh, constructed even for KP and KD, which are uh, full and not diagonal, still symmetric and positive definite. So imagine that you have a, a planar uh, robot with three revolute joints, 
uh, and the desired configuration is the one uh, shown uh, in orange in the, in the slide. Now this plane is indeed a horizontal plane because we have assumed so far that the gravity term is not present, so the potential energy should be constant. Now we associate to each value of the, the two gain matrices either a stiffness of the spring, so a spring with a stiffness KPI at joint I, or a viscous damping element with damping coefficient KDI. And we do exactly the following. Suppose that we are in a generic configuration. The current configuration is the one in green. And this may be also the initial configuration at zero, at zero velocity. Now, in order to obtain the desired configuration, we place some reference stick, in the sense, mounted at the base of each link and connect uh, this reference stick to the associate link in a decentralized way, as I said, through the spring of stiffness Kp and the uh, uh, damping uh, element with uh, viscosity Kd. Pay attention that uh, the way in which we are assigning this reference uh, is relative to the previous link. So you can see that for the first link, the, red uh, the orange bar is exactly in the uh, orientation of the first link of the desired configuration. Now, the second link in the desired configuration should make uh, um, an angle of 90 degree, actually 90 degree positive because it's counted, uh, uh, sorry, negative because it's counted uh, clockwise with respect to the first link. So the second reference bar is placed at minus 90 degrees with respect to the first bar uh, at the end of the first link or at the base of the second link. And we connect then the spring and damper to the second link. Similarly, the third link should make, uh, like I would say, uh, 45 degrees or maybe 60 degrees if the first angle was 30 positive with respect to the second link. So we mount in that, with that angle, the last uh, stick, which is the reference, which has, um, assigned the reference to uh, the third joint. And we connect again Kp3 and Kd3 uh, gains, which are mechanically a spring with such stiffness and a viscous element with such coefficient Kdi. So, uh, if we keep everything, we hold this device for a moment and then we leave it, so we start at time zero with the evolution, uh, the motion of this mechanical system subject to springs and dampers will be the motion of our robot where all this machinery, this mechanical uh, uh, object are not there, but we have a software commanded PD controller. So the evolution will be the same. And you can imagine that the robot will start moving, accelerating and then oscillating and then damping away uh, its velocity until it stops. And the only position where uh, this system can stop uh, for sure is the desired configuration QD. So this is a, a nice mechanical interpretation. You could also build a device that does this at home uh, just with a uh, uh, mechanical objects, so springs and, and, and damping uh, objects that can be bought uh, in the stores. Uh, and with this Lego or Meccano-like uh, construction, uh, you can prove that everything works uh, as we have seen in the mathematical, mathematical formulas of Jacob. Uh, now, uh, this next slide shows what happened? Why do we need uh, to use LaSalle theorem? And we cannot, we are not able, at least, uh, there's no such candidate known, to prove directly asymptotic stability uh, without resorting to, to LaSalle theorem. So, this is a, a, a qualitative behavior of our Lyapunov candidate. At time zero, 
we suppose that we start at rest, so kinetic energy is equal to zero. So the remaining term in the candidate is just the uh, quadratic term in terms uh, of the position error. So we start with a value which is known because we know where we are, we know we, where we would like to be. Kp is again in our control law, so it's something that we have chosen. So we know for sure that we start from a known value v at time zero, v zero, which is uh, uh, which is uh, shown on on the on the graph. It's the first uh, value on top. Now, by the way, uh, I forgot to say that this second term with this mechanical interpretation is exactly the potential energy associated to those set of springs that we mounted on the, on the physical system. Uh, so we can use this uh, mechanical interpretation uh, so by saying that the system has in fact, the, the, the candidate function is in fact the sum of uh, uh, kinetic energy of the real system and of the potential energy of the springs of this virtual system. In fact, this potential energy is the potential energy associated to our control law. There are no springs at all, but this can uh, be given, uh, this interpretation can be given based on this example that I showed. Now, um, at time zero, the velocity is zero, so V dot, which is minus Q dot transpose KD times Q dot, is also zero. So the tangent of the function V. Uh, of the evolution of the function phi over time, so v dot, in fact, because the x-axis is represented by time, is horizontal. But as soon as, uh, since we are not in the desired configuration because the error is different from zero, otherwise the function v would start from zero and we are already where we should be, so the acceleration will be different from zero, so the system will move. So we will get some velocity, and for sure, the value of the potent of the Lyapunov function will decrease because v dot will be negative if q dot is different from zero, no matter if q dot is positive or negative. You see that this analysis is made on a single scalar function without making reference at all of what is the type of robot, how many joints has the robot, what type of joints are, uh, the robot has. The only condition that we have set so far is that uh, gravity plays no role. So g of q is identically zero. Otherwise, this consideration are fully general. So the Lyapunov function will start decreasing. And it will never go over the value of v of zero because in order to do that, it should become should have, a, a, for some instant of time, a positive time derivative. And this is never the case. So it decreases. The star decreases faster, slower. This depends on many aspects. But suppose that at some time we have uh, a flat, a, plot, a plateau, where v dot is equal to zero. And this can be repeated several times. Now, v dot can be zero only if the velocity stops, so since the velocity is equal to zero, which means all velocities of all joints are simultaneously zero. So, uh, this happens during the transient because you have a kind of motion inversion. Now, the easiest way of thinking about that is considering a single horizontal link, and uh, which is initially at rest, and suppose that you want to do a, a slew of 90 degrees. So you set plus 90 as your reference, and then you let this link move. Now, the link will approach the desired uh, angular position, but typically would uh, overshoot it, and will start oscillating and then damping out its velocity around the desired configuration until it reaches the final value of 90 degrees. Now, every time the system inverts the motion, so the link inverts the motion in this case, in this case there is only one, singular, one, one uh, single value of velocities, the velocity will go to zero, from positive to negative. 
And this is exactly where the Lyapunov function will have a single instant in which the tangent to the time profile will be horizontal. But indeed, there could not be a finite interval in which this remains zero, because otherwise uh, we would have also acceleration zero during that interval. And this, by the analysis that we have made, can happen only when we have reached the final destination. So when E becomes zero, together with the velocity. So this, uh, when this happens, not only uh, the derivative will be zero for a finite interval, but it will be zero forever, because we have reached our destination. So this is a very interesting consideration. Uh, the rate of change of decrease of V depends on the actual robot, on the actual gains, on the initial uh, states, on the initial configuration, how, how far we are from the destination and so on. But this general behavior is rather common. There could be also cases in which there is no instant in which all the joint velocities are uh, zero at the same time, so you will only see a decrease. It could be slow, but asymptotically the value will go to zero as shown in this uh, picture. Now, few other comments on this PD control law. Remember that gravity is not there, so we will move after these comments uh, to the case of uh, presence of gravity. So first of all, uh, Indeed, we have said that Kp and Kd uh, can be diagonal, uh, or in any case should be positive definite. If they are diagonal, this positive definite uh, occurs if and only if all the elements on the diagonal are positive. But in general, you can choose also uh, full Kp and Kd. But even in the simple case, where you choose diagonal Kp and Kd, so if the robot has, for instance, six joints, then you have to choose six gains for the proportional terms and six gains for the derivative term, the, the element on the diagonal of this six by six matrices. Now, this cho choosing the right gains, before, beside being positive, of course, there are many possible choices that you could be. And it's uh, the choice that you make will affect the type, the nature, and the duration of the transient and also the practical settling time, in the sense how long will it take until you are close to the desired configuration, close enough. Indeed, since we cannot prove exponential uh, stability, but only asymptotic stability, we have no clues on uh, how long will be this trend. So, we could start doing tests, trials, and tune the uh, gain matrices so that the behavior is optimal. But one set of value may be good for a, for a given robot, for a specific motion, for another motion, uh, another set may be superior. So having an optimal behavior over all possible motion and all, uh, the whole uh, workspace for a given robot is a very hard task. Sometimes the choice of a full gain matrices, so not diagonal, uh, helps in uh, defining the value of Kp, Kd, which works reasonably well, at least when we're getting closer to the destination. Why? Because at that time, we can uh, use the linear approximation of the model, so of the closed loop system, in which Kp and Kd here and use uh, the degree of freedom to assign to the linearized approximated model, which holds as long as you're close to the destination, so with uh, small velocity and qd minus current q small enough, uh, to assign the eigenvalue to the closed loop system. So on the linear system, we know that, for instance, assigning a real eigenvalue with avoid oscillation overshooting and something like that. If we move far away to the left of the complex plane, the eigenvalue, we know that this is associated to a, a rapid decrease. 
uh, need with a larger value of the control law, so with more effort, and so on and so on. So this is the reason why full KP and KD may be useful, exactly for tuning them, taking into account what happens close to the destination. Of course, the initial transit may be not the best one that you uh, can achieve. And there's a large variability. So to make a long story short, the tuning is very hard in this complex, the tuning of the gains. Uh, second comment is uh, we neglected any type of friction. Let's consider just for a moment uh, the presence of viscous friction at the joint. So an effect which is uh, a subtraction of um, energy from the applied uh, control law. Uh, remember that dissipative term happens to appear in the dynamic model on the right hand side of the Euler Lagrangian equation, exactly where also the control law is acting. So in that case, viscous, fric viscous friction term would be of the form minus F v q dot, where f v is a diagonal matrix, and on the diagonal you see the uh, uh, viscous friction coefficient for each joint. Now, these terms look very similarly, and in fact, act very similarly to the term minus kd q dot in the control law. Uh, in principle, if you're guaranteed that you have enough, enough viscous friction in your system, you can also achieve uh, global asymptotic stabilization of any configuration without the derivative term in your control law, because the damping is made by the uh, viscous term which is present in the system. Indeed, if the viscous term is small, you cannot rely in a very fast transient, so uh, dissipation of energy fast enough for your need, and this is why you introduce in any case uh, the, term, the derivative terms which can be modulated at will. Uh, the other point which uh, concludes this uh, set of comments is that uh, when you have a full PD, you need a measurement of position, joint position, which is obtained by encoder, if uh, uh, this is the standard solution. You may also have systems which have analog sensor of position, like resolvers or potentiometers, but this is uh, uh, more and more obsolete. But you don't have, typically, a tachometer for measuring the velocity. So you need to make some kind of numerical uh, derivative of the position measurement in order to uh, have an estimate of the current velocity to be used in the control law. And this can be done in several ways. So, uh, let's look at the problem from a continuous or a discrete time point of view. So, suppose that uh, this is the starting control law, so U of t, uh, now I'm putting t because uh, I would like to see what happens when I'm sampling this controller or when I'm implementing directly a digital control law, which is updated at every sampling time. So U of t is uh, kp times the error at that instant plus kd times the derivative of the error at that instant where the derivative of the error is nothing else than minus q dot. This is the ideal design. This is the, uh, the control law for which we have proven asymptotic stability. Now, if we, uh, since this is a combination of uh, signals uh, and a uh, linear combination of signals, in fact, uh, we can use Laplace, Laplace transform in order to represent this into the Laplace domain. I hope you're familiar with this notation. Uh, if not, you replace every signal with this uh, transform in, in the domain S, in the complex domain S, so E of T becomes E of S, and every time you have a derivative of a signal, the transform of the signal, uh, differentiated signal, is S times the Laplace transform of the original one. In the same way, if you have an integral uh, term of your signal, you will have as a transform a factor 1 over S multiplying the transform of the original signal. 
So in our case, when we move to Laplace, we have the transform of uh, the u of time, so u of s equal kp, the transform of uh, the error in time, and then plus kd, the transform of the derivative of uh, the error in time, so this is s times e of s. So we can uh, see that, uh, seen from an input point of view, if we take the error uh, as, a, uh, as the input of our controller, the position error as the input of our controller, and we generate a U which is a PD action on this signal, so without an information about the velocity, in fact, the transfer function of the controller will be KP plus KDS. So there is a, uh, it's just a function uh, um, without uh, any denominator, so this would be a numerator only, so this, this transfer function from E of S to U of S, so from the error in input to the controller and the uh, command U output from the controller and going to the robot, is a non-realizable function. So this means that if you don't have a measurement of Q dot, which means of E dot, you cannot realize this exactly. So in general, uh, when you have a non-realizable transfer function, so one uh, f um, function as a um, ratio of polynomial with the polynomial at the numerator having degree uh, larger than the denominator at the, the, the polynomial at the, the denominator, so in this case the numerator has degree 1, the denominator has degree 0 because it's not there, it's just 1 if you wish, then uh, in order to obtain a realizable implementation, you take the derivative term, so the terms kd times s, and you filter it at a certain bandwidth. So you add the pole uh, with a constant time tau, a small constant time, which means that up to the frequency 1 over tau, you're taking the correct derivative. Beyond that, when this pole intervenes in the frequency response of the system, you're not really doing the derivative, you're doing the dirty derivative in a sense. Okay. Now if you look at this transfer function now, and you uh, uh, put the denominator in common, so you will have 1 plus tau s in the denominator, so a polynomial of degree 1, in the numerator you will have kp plus kp tau s plus kds, so again uh, uh, the numerator will be a polynomial of degree 1, so you have recovered um, causality in a sense. This is a proper transfer function, in fact it's the sum of a constant gain plus a strictly proper transfer function, like uh, you can always uh, rearrange things in this way. So this is the way in which you implement things. If you had an analog system, then you would implement this type of transfer function, one that is proper and then realize it. And this means that in practice you're not taking derivative uh, of all frequency component of your signal, of your error signal, but you limit to a given bandwidth the derivative action. So you're doing an approximation. Now, what if you're implementing this in discrete time? So there are many ways to to get there, uh, I will use the so-called zeta transform, which is another transformation in the complex domain, uh, which is associated to a sequence of samples in general, the zeta transform. And you can have mapping between the Laplace complex domain and the Z complex domain. So the two complex planes can be mapped one to each other, depending on how you implement uh, derivation and integration. For instance, if you use the backward differentiation rule on the samples which you uh, acquire and generate every TC second, for instance every TC equal one millisecond, if you're using this type of sampling uh, time, then the S is substituted by this one minus Z to the minus one times TC. Now I will be not detail this because either you know what I'm talking about or it's kind of difficult to uh, explain in short, but essentially 
each factor z to the minus 1 uh, is equivalent to a delay of one step. So if you take uh, a signal at the, uh, at the instance t of, uh, t of k, and you take the same signal in the transformed domain pre-multiplied by z to the minus 1, you're using the value delayed by one step. So you're using at time tk the value at time tk minus 1. So this is uh, the, uh, the digital version of uh, the original PD non-realizable transfer function. Uh, you will see that uh, in the digital domain, since you're computing things based on the current and on the previous um, component uh, or samples, uh, this will turn out to be realizable as well. In much the same way, you can do the transformation on the transfer function of the uh, bandwidth limited PD action. So you replace, even in the same context, you replace to each S that you encounter in the transfer function the expression 1 minus C minus 1 divided by TC. And now you can go back to the sequence of samples. And uh, you recognize now that both digital controllers uh, in their discrete time implementation uh, of this PD action are realizable. So they don't use future sample in order to compute uh, the current one. They can only use the current samples or samples from previous instance. So if you uh, go back with this transformation and you elaborate things, uh, the first expression says that the current command, TOR command, that you're sending to your actuators is kp times the error at that instance, so the position error at the instance, plus kd, uh, the difference between the current error and the error at the previous sampling time divided by the uh, sampling time interval. Okay, this is our, what you have, would have done probably right from the start, uh, looking back at the time domain expression of your PD, uh, when you implement the E dot, you implement it as just the difference between the current value, the previous value, and the duration of the time interval of sample. But here you can see also a slight uh, variation. Uh, if you want to implement this by giving some uh, limited bandwidth to the derivation, which means also that you're filtering any noise at high frequency uh, associated to this derivation, then the resulting uh, discrete time implementation is slightly different. In fact, you can recognize the same proportional action. This is an instantaneous action, so KPAK. Uh, the last term is uh, similar to the uh, discrete uh, backward differentiation, so you're taking the two sample AK, you subtract AK minus 1, and you divide it by the sampling interval, but you add to this also the small uh, time constant tau. And typically tau is uh, one-tenth of TC. So this is almost the same. What is new is that you have an extra term, which is based on the last control sample that you have computed in the previous sampling instance. So this term tau over tau plus tc times uk minus 1. So this gives some continuity, some smoothness in a sense uh, to your results. Okay, this was uh, a few words on the implementation in the digital context of a, a PD control law. Now let's move to uh, the next subject okay so let's uh, say okay so far we had no gravity so the model was m of q times q double dot plus c of q q dot equal the command u what if we have gravity like in I would say most of the cases mm -hmm. We have seen where gravity can be neglected or is absent. No? Certainly for planar motion on a horizontal plane, in the far space where 
gravity has little or no role, but of course there are other problems there, and so on. So what if we have a, a, a certain uh, um, a standard situation in which g of q is present in the model? We have already seen that the PD controller is not enough because it does not guarantee that the desired configuration is an equilibrium. There could be another equilibrium, in fact, uh, in the closed system, but not the desired one. So the uh, simplest way to handle the presence of gravity is to cancel it. So this is a really a nonlinear action in your controller. Why? Because if your controller is the PD action as before, so KP times QD minus Q minus QD times Q dot, and you're adding these terms in the control law, so you're computing based on the model information the uh, gravity vector and using also the current measurement of the joint angles, G of Q, so you will have this on the right hand side. On the left hand side, you have now also g of q, so these two terms uh, are equal and cancel each other. So if you're applying this type of law, uh, you end up with a system which is exactly as before. So without gravity in the dynamics and just with a PD control law. So there is no need of any analysis or proof uh, using the same argument, you know, that this type of control law uh, globally, asymptotically stabilizes the desired state Q equal QD and Q dot equal zero um, under the assumption that KP and KD are positive definite. Okay? It's nonlinear because the evaluation of G of Q is not only the evaluation of, uh, and it contains not only sums and products like in the PD part of this control law, but in general trigonometric evaluation. So you have to store, uh, to evaluate sine and cosine of different combination of Q. Uh, so it's slightly more complex. And also the analysis in this case, uh, you have a nonlinear controller, uh, you have still a nonlinear robot, so you cannot use uh, linear techniques like pole placement or uh, eigenvalues and so on. You have to deal with the nonlinearity uh, as such. And uh, this is why we developed or we introduced or we make reference to the Lyapunov analysis, which works both for linear and nonlinear systems. Uh, the main difference is now that uh, if you're canceling gravity, you have to know at least those dynamic terms. In particular, you have to identify uh, the dynamic coefficients which are present in the gravity term of your model. And this may not always be the case. For instance, if you're uh, grasping an object, online, you don't know the object weight, and this will change uh, many parts in the model, but in particular the one, uh, the gravity term that you uh, need to implement in this controller. So um, this is no longer a non-model based uh, control action. You don't have to know much of the model, but uh, uh, at least the gravity term should be known. So, uh, what happens if you have just an estimate, an approximate estimate? Let's call this approximate estimate g hat instead of the correct g cubed. So, the model uh, has a g hat, and so you're using uh, this information in your control. Of. The real system has a g of q, the real one, and these are different. They may be different for many reasons, for their structure, but in particular, they may have the same structure, but the dynamic coefficient may be different in the two cases. So, uh, in, in one particular case is when G hat is vanishing. So you're just applying a PD control. Then you know that you will not get to the desired QD. So whatever G hat you're using, an approximate one, none of it, uh, a, a very good one in structure but with the wrong coefficient and so on, uh, you will end up with a steady state uh, final position 
which has an error. So you will get to some configuration Q star, which is different from QD. And depending on where you're starting from, how far you are at the beginning, and probably on the dynamic characteristic, even the inertia characteristic of your robot, this Q star may not be unique, and so you can reach different steady state situation all wrong with respect to the QCR, Q desired. Uh, if, uh, however, you increase KP enough without bringing it to infinity, by the way, but there's a lower bound on KP that guarantees that this uh, steady state configuration Q star that you reach will be unique. And the larger you take KP, the closer will Q star uh, be to Q desired. But the, uh, let's say, bringing to zero this difference, so having the desired equilibrium as the uh, desired uh, configuration as the equilibrium in the closed loop, with this type of control law, when G hat is uh, not the correct G, uh, occurs only when you bring KP to infinity. Okay. Now, uh, you can give an, a nice interpretation to, to these results of having this steady state error. Because when you're reaching a steady state, <coughs> sorry, you're in a configuration where the gravity term becomes constant. And you can consider this as a disturbance acting on your system. Without this disturbance, so without the presence of gravity, you know that the PD would work. So you would bring the system at steady state to the zero error situation. Instead, uh, at steady state, you have a constant disturbance because of this, uh, because of the presence of gravity. And since the system, the control, has no integral action before the uh, position in the block diagram where this uh, disturbing torque actually is acting, then you expect to have such type of error. Indeed, this is a, just a, 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 a linear uh, interpretation of what happens, but it's pretty much a good one. In fact, you will have this steady steady error and you can reduce this steady steady error uh, by increasing Kp, but only K going with Kp to infinity, this will go to zero. Otherwise, you need to, enter, to introduce some uh, integral action, and we will see how to do this later on. Now, uh, the next control law, so in the presence of gravity, the first thing that you can do is cancel gravity. Uh, and the control law becomes automatically a nonlinear one. However, you could do something uh, sometimes more smart, more simple to, do, to implement. In particular, the reason why uh, without the gravity term in your PD, uh, you would uh, not regulate your desired configuration uh, is because at the destination, if there is a gravity term, uh, if, if the gravity is acting in the final configuration, you have to compensate for it. So the idea here is why not modify the PD control that we have designed in the absence of gravity by adding a constant term which compensate gravity only at destination. Now, you add it from the beginning, but this value is the value that will remain also at the end when the position error has gone to zero and the velocity has gone to zero. So you will be left in the control law with the gravity compensating uh, the effect uh, at the destination. So you would like to add a term which is G of QD. We will see this in a moment. Uh, and then study if this works. Because the fact that this is the right command at destination does not imply, so it's an equilibrium, the closed loop system has the desired equilibrium, does not mean that this equilibrium is asymptotically stable and even that is globally asymptotically stable. So depending on where you start, you may end up uh, in a, you may get stuck in some intermediate configuration. So we need an analysis of this. And you will see that this analysis is a bit more complex than the one of the PD control by itself. 
in the absence of gravity. And we will use a structural property uh, that we already mentioned when dealing with dynamics, which is the following. Suppose that, uh, well, the, the g of q, so the vector term uh, related to gravity, uh, contains in general trigonometric terms, sometimes linear terms in q when we have uh, uh, prismatic joints, uh, but in any case, uh, there's a structural property that holds. If you take this gravity vector and you take its gradient with respect to q, and you remember, by the way, that g itself was the gradient of the potential energy associated to gravity with respect to Q. So the result will be a matrix, a Hessian of the potential energy, and this is the first expression. So the structural properties that holds, and we will not prove this, but uh, we will use it in, in the proof, is that there is a bound, an upper bound, on the norm of this matrix. So for any Q, you can find so there exists, and you can find a value alpha, larger than zero, that is greater than the norm of this matrix. And this matrix, as I said, can be written in two equivalent ways, either the Hessian of the potential energy with respect to Q, so the second derivative, or the gradient, so the first derivative, of the vector G with respect to the vector Q. A consequence of this, using exactly this second uh, expression, is that if you take any two different configuration, it could be Q1 and Q2, uh, where 1 and 2 are associated to different configuration of a robot with n degrees of freedom. Uh, or, like it is written in the slide, it could be the desired configuration QD and a generic other one. And if you make the difference between the gravity vector in QD and the gravity vector in this generic configuration Q, then the norm of this, let's say, gravity error term can be bounded by the same alpha that is bounding the norm of the gradient of the gravity times the norm of the difference between the current configuration and the desired one. And this is a very powerful inequality because on the left-hand side you have terms that depends on the model, I mean, directly on the model. On the right-hand side, uh, Q minus QD does not depend on the model that you have, while the alpha is a bound on some model terms and derivative of these model terms. But indeed, you can be very conservative, so you don't need to know exactly the value of the masses of the center of gravity of the single link, all the dynamic parameters that happens to appear in the gravity term. So you have, this inequality allows you to release from this dependence, at least in the analysis. Uh, the other note before we start with the controller and the, and the proof is that those are matrices. So the norm is intended as a matrix norm which is induced by, induced by the standard Euclidean norm that we use for vectors. So, for instance, in the uh, expression in the yellow box, uh, all terms are vectors, so these are vector norms, and we can take, for instance, the Euclidean norm, so the P equal to standard norm. So, we, uh, when we uh, consider instead norm of matrices, induced by this norm, uh, on, the, on the vector and considering the matrices as operators, so mapping vectors into vectors, the uh, associated norm is the one shown here. So the square root of the maximum eigenvalue of the matrix A transpose A. Now A transpose A is, uh, uh, I mean, if matrix A is symmetric, then we know that all its eigenvalues are real but some may be positive and some may be negative. If you take A T times A, not only this is uh, symmetric, so all its eigenvalues are real, but it's also semi-positive definite, so they are real and non-negative. 
So you can order them from the lowest one to the largest one, and you take the largest eigenvalue of A transpose A, and you take the square root, in a sense, you're compensating the fact that you make the product of the matrix by its transpose, and this will be the norm. It, and it's a norm in the sense that satisfies all the conditions for a mathematical object to be a norm. And we often call this also, for the matrix A, uh, A with capital M. Uh, you can also, at this point, since you have a list of uh, eigenvalues, you take the smallest of these eigenvalues. They will all be positive or zero. So if you take the smallest eigenvalues of A3 transpose and you take the square root, we will use the notation A small m, and indeed this value will be less or equal than A capital M, which is the norm of the matrix. Okay, so this was the long but necessary premise. Let's see our control law. Pay attention, this is a linear control law because there is no uh, nonlinear operation on the measurement Q. The PD action is a linear feedback, and the second term is a constant feed forward that you have computed once for all without any measurement Q. So you can compute this offline and then use it at runtime. And we will make also the preliminary assumption that KP and KD are positive definite and without loss of generality we can take them symmetric. So that will this uh, control works if we put this controller into the dynamic equation of the robot and we look at steady state conditions so where Q dot is equal to zero and Q double dot is equal to zero so we are not moving, moving then we can see that Q equal Q desired uh, is an equilibrium, okay, with Q dot equal zero. But, so we need to show that uh, this equilibrium is asymptotically stable. And this is what this theorem uh, proves. Uh, under a, an extra condition, so not only we have chosen KP positive definite, but we should take the minimum eigenvalue of kp transpose kp if kp is non-diagonal. Otherwise, the minimum element on the diagonal of kp larger, strictly larger, than the bound alpha on the norm of the gradient of the gravity term. Then if we choose this, again, it's a sufficient condition, then the desired state Q equal Q desired and Q dot equal zero, using the joint space PD control plus constant gravity compensation at QD, so we are not canceling gravity everywhere, we're just adding the term that compensated at the destination, then the closed loop system and this equilibrium will be globally asymptotically stable. So exactly the same result that you would get without gravity, with the simple PD, or with gravity, with cancellation uh, at every configuration of the gravity term, so PD plus G of Q. Now, the proof, uh, first of all, we have said that the uh, QD zero is an equilibrium state for the closed loop. So this guarantees that the control makes sense. But the first thing that we have to deal if we want to have globality, is that this is the only, so the unique closed loop equilibrium of the system. So let's look at the uh, equilibrium situation. No? So when uh, we have Q double dot is equal to zero because uh, this is, uh, we are not moving from our state, so Q dot is also zero. So what is left is on, let's say, on the left hand side of the model, g of q only. Uh, on the right hand side of the equation of the model, we have the PD plus gravity compensation at destination, so we have KPE uh, plus g of qd. Of course, the derivative term is gone because the velocity is zero. So if you re rearrange things, you bring one term to the other side, you will see that uh, we have this equation holding at any closed loop equilibrium. So KPE equal J of Q minus J of QD. 
Indeed, if we put them there, um, Q equal QD, the right hand side becomes zero, the error E becomes zero, and this holds. This is in fact what we have commented before. But we need to show that this is the only way in which this identity can be satisfied. In fact, if there were another closed loop equilibrium which satisfies this, so with a Q different from QD, then we have the following chain of inequalities. So we take the norm of the left hand side, so we take the norm of Kp times E, and this is larger than equal than the norm of E times the minimum possible value of Kp, let's say on the diagonal. Okay? So we have the first inequality. The second inequality is the one that uh, is in the hypothesis of the theorem, that uh, this Kp minimum is strictly larger than alpha. So we have that this term with the norm of E is strictly larger than alpha times the norm of E, which is Qd minus Q or Q minus Qd, and by the property that this alpha is a bounding term on the gradient of the gravity vector, this is larger or equal than the norm of g of q minus g of qd. And if you look at this chain of inequality and you have a strict inequality at the center, then you see that uh, if q is different from uh, q desired, uh, and you should have still the balance of the two terms, but on one side you have the norm of the left-hand side of the equality, which is strictly larger than the norm of the other side, and this is impossible in order to have the equality uh, holding. So this proves that uh, the desired, configuration, uh, desired state in the closed loop QD0 is the unique closed loop equilibrium. Now, uh, consider the Lyapunov candidate. Uh, the Lyapunov candidate now is, uh, requires some explanation. So, the, uh, first of all, we notice that the first part is exactly the same one that we used for proving PD in the absence of gravity. So, there's a virtual spring term, which is the control effort term with the Kp. There's a kinetic energy. And then we add also the potential energy because now the gravity is present. We subtract to this the potential energy at the desired uh, configuration, and we have also a term which is the product, the scalar product of the gravity vector at the destination times the error in position. And this is a kind of a mixed term which appears to be coming out of the blue. In fact, it is not obvious that this is needed. The fact that you have all the three last terms, so you have a, some kind of modification of potential energy, is because you need to have uh, a Lyapunov candidate which is strictly positive uh, outside the uh, desired state. So you need both of these terms. So let's see if this is a this function that we have introduced uh, simply as that is a candidate. So if it is positive for any state except the desired one, the desired equilibrium, so where uh, Q is equal to Q desired, so the error is zero and Q dot is equal to zero. Now, in order to show that this is the case, so that this is the right candidate, and this is the most work that we have to do because otherwise the rest of the proof is really application of the same technique that we have seen before. Uh, so we show that uh, this function is convex both in Q dot and in the error. In fact, uh, what matters is the error, the difference between Qd and, and, and Q, which we would like to bring to zero. If we write it in this uh, form, no, so that it's convex, so it's increasing, uh, and it's zero only for E equal Q dot equal zero, so when we are in the desired configuration and we have zero velocity, then this candidate is a correct candidate. So
So in order to show this, uh, we take the derivative of v with respect to q dot and with respect to the position r of e. If we take the derivative with respect to q dot, q dot appears in the function only in the kinetic energy. So this uh, would give, uh, uh, remember, v is a scalar, so when we take the derivative with respect to a vector, in this case q dot, we get a, a row vector, so we need to transpose in order to get a column. So if we do this, uh, if we take the derivative, we would get twice the same quantity, so we can remove the factor one half and have q dot transpose times m. When we transpose this, we get m times q dot, remembering that the matrix, the inertia matrix, is symmetric. So, uh, and this shows that this derivative is equal to zero, so we have a minimum or a maximum if and only if the velocity is zero, because m of q is a positive definite and therefore invertible matrix. Now, in order to see if in this direction we have a minimum or a maximum, we should look at the second derivative and evaluate this uh, where we have zero, the necessary condition for a stationary point, so the first derivative. If we take the second derivative with respect to q dot, uh, then we end up with m of q, this is positive definite, so this is typically associated to a minimum. But what about the other direction? So, uh, we see that we need to have q dot equal zero in order to zero the function. So we take the derivative with respect to the error uh, when q dot is equal to zero. So we neglect the presence of kinetic energy in a sense. So, uh, in the remaining term, we have uh, the first term is quadratic in, in the error, so the derivative and then transposition, just like before, in order to get a column vector, is equal to KPE. Then we have the derivative of the potential energy U with respect to E, but remember that E is QD minus Q, so taking the derivative uh, imply a chain rule, so uh, the derivative of u with respect to q is just the derivative of u with respect to e with a sign minus, because we have the, in the chain rule the derivative of e with respect to q is minus the identity. So the second term is minus du over dq, and then we have to transpose it, so uh, we have that term. Uh, then we have minus ukd u of qd, and this is a constant, so its derivative is zero. And finally, the linear terms in the error, so when we take the derivative with respect to E and transpose this, we get exactly G of QD. Now, uh, remember that the gravity term is nothing else than the gradient of the potential energy, so the second term is, in fact, G of Q. So we are left with the condition that the derivative with respect to the second set of variables, so the error, we have just uh, replaced the q with the error, is kpe plus j of qd minus j of q. And in order to have a stationary point, uh, we have uh, to zero this term. But this is nothing else than the equilibrium that we studied before, and we know that this happens to be zero if and only if q is equal to qd. And the fact that this stationary point is a minimum uh, is shown by the second derivative still evaluated at q dot equals zero with respect to the error, so d square b over de square. So if we take the derivative of the previous uh, expression, we have uh, again uh, just kp, then we have a g of q, we take the derivative with respect to e and not of q, so we have to change again the sign, so we have a plus uh, second derivative of u with respect to q squared, and since uh, the norm of kp, which is kp maximum, so with the lambda max, is greater or equal than kp with the minimum, and this kp with the minimum is larger than alpha, which dominates the norm of the second term, so the norm of d squared u over dq squared, then this shows that this quantity will certainly be positive and that therefore this is a minimum. 
So the function increases uh, and has a, a single minimum, as we have seen, in the co configuration, uh, in the state, uh, in the desired state, q equal qd and q dot equal zero. And this is what our conclusion is now shown on the slide. So, at this point, we have to look at the time derivative of this candidate. So the function is a candidate, so it's uh, a good point to start with. Uh, and we take the derivative. And now I will be more uh, speedy, because the first two terms, their derivative is exactly the same as we have found before. Uh, so uh, q dot transpose uh, times the terms in the, um, in the bracket minus e transpose kp q dot now the next terms is the time derivative of u so again change rule the time derivative of u with respect to q and then of q with respect to time which gives us q dot uh, and finally uh, we have a constant term which vanishes in the derivation and then e transpose g of qd, again we take the time derivative of e dot, which is minus q dot transpose times g of qd. Uh, we substitute the model because we have to evaluate the uh, v dot along the trajectory of the closed loop system. So first we are not replacing the control law, so to m q double dot we replace uh, the terms u and then we bring everything on the uh, right hand side, so minus s times q dot minus g. And then there's another term that was already present with the m dot in the, in the bracket. Uh, and on the last two terms, we uh, take the, this is a scalar, du over dq times q dot, so it's equal to its transpose, so we have q dot transpose times du over dq transpose, which is nothing else than the gravity terms. So we have a subtraction of uh, g minus g, g of q minus g of q dz i pre-multiplied by q dot transpose. Now we use again the uh, property that uh, m dot minus 2s or what is equivalent one half m dot minus s vanishes when being the matrix in the quadratic form with the same velocity outside q dot transpose and q dot. So this term is gone. And then we replace the u with the control law, which is kpe minus kdq dot, and then plus j g of q desired. Uh, all these terms are pre-multiplied by q dot transpose. So you see that we have generated a, an extra term from the first bracket, which is q dot transpose g of qd minus g of q. And the rest remains the same. Now, these two terms cancel because Kp is symmetric and one is the transpose of the other with the opposite sign. And similarly, these two terms also cancel. So the whole introduction of extra terms in the uh, Lyapunov candidate was meant to arrive at this cancellation because otherwise we would not know the sign of this term. So this long story reduces in the fact that the time derivative of this Lyapunov candidate is exactly the same as in the case of no gravity. So minus q dot transpose kd q dot, with kd being positive definite, this quantity is less or equal than zero. Okay. So uh, let's see what LaSalle tells us, because up to now we have just proven uh, stability. So when uh, V dot is zero, uh, if and only if the velocity, all velocity are zero, so let's look at the dynamics under this condition in the closed loop. So the Coriolis and centrifugal term vanishes, so we have M of Q, Q double dot plus G equal the control law, where Q dot is now Z, so it's just KPE uh, plus G of Q desired, the constant compensation at the desired configuration. So we can isolate the acceleration as well. Now the acceleration is, uh, carries over more terms than in the case of no gravity, indeed. But still, we, have, uh, we can isolate acceleration because the inertia matrix is non-singular. 
So we have m to the minus 1 times kp plus g of qd, and then we have brought the gravity at the current configuration on the other side. And now, uh, the acceleration will be 0 if and only if the term in parentheses multiplying m to the minus 1, which is non-singular, is 0. But this is 0 if and only if uh, q is equal to q desired, so when the error is 0. So the acceleration will be 0 only if also the position error is 0. And the Sal theorem says that we will converge to this unique state, which is the maximum invariant set contained in the set of states which zeroes the derivative of the Lyapunov of candidate, and so the result, the thesis of the theorem follows. So let's see uh, an example. No, we do uh, the most simple example that I could think of, uh, but it has also some peculiarities. So I'm considering now as a pendulum, so a single link robot under gravity, but now the robot, this link, is actuated, so it qualifies as a robot in a sense. Uh, here you see again the uh, model, so there's an, this is a, a model with distributed mass, so we have an inertia around the center of mass, uh, moved to the joint axis, so we will have the inertia, let's say, EC plus MD square, and this becomes the inertia I, which multiplies the acceleration T double dot in the model on the, in the equation below the picture. And then we have plus mg0d times sine of theta, which is the gravity term, equal the torque that we apply to the controller. Now, suppose that uh, we can start from any point. Typically, we start from the lower equilibrium with zero velocity, so with theta equals zero, and we would like to do a swing up. So to bring the, uh, this single link robot in the upward equilibrium. So with t desired equal pi. Now, in that configuration, as we have already seen, uh, gravity vanishes, like in the lower equilibrium. So if we apply PD control plus gravity compensation, in fact, we are only apply a PD control. And the control law will be Kp times Q desi theta desired in this case, so pi minus the current theta minus Kd, the joint velocity theta dot, it would be plus g of theta desired, but this is zero. So this is a PD uh, working under gravity, because uh, at the destination the gravity term vanishes. But still we have to overcome gravity during the transient. So the theorem says that even in this case we need to have a proportional gain Kp which is larger than the alpha that dominates the gravity. Gradient. Now, in this case, everything is scalar, so everything is very simple. So, if we look at the, gra uh, at the gravity term mg0d times sine of theta, we can bound this since m is positive, g0 is positive, and d is positive. Uh, we can eliminate the sine and have an upper bound for this. So, alpha in this case is simply taken as mg0d. So, the theorem says that if our PD controller, even without the gravity compensation term, because this constant term is zero at the destination for this particular case, the proportional gain should be larger than alpha, and the derivative gain should be positive in any case. So if we look at the Lyapunov candidate that we have seen in general, and we applied it to this simple case, and we look just at the section. No, no, now, the Lyapunov candidate in this simple case is a function of only two variables, theta and theta dot. Now, so we could uh, show a, a plot of the Lyapunov candidates uh, on a two-dimensional plane with a third dimension used for the values of v, but this is not important. We just can uh, cross the, the, the plane uh, at the at the value theta dot equals zero, because if theta dot is different from zero, the kinetic energy will certainly increase. So we just look at the worst case, what is the values of, what are the values of V of theta for theta dot equals zero. And you can see that if you choose a gain, and therefore uh, the same gain is being used also 
in the diagram of candidate, which is smaller than alpha, in particular is the half of alpha, the first plot on the left hand side shows that you have stationary point one at pi, so 3.40, but also two other values which are before and after the uh, upward equilibrium, so on the left and on the side, and these are minima while the other is a local maximum, so this will be unstable in a sense. So if you let a ball roll, if you start at rest uh, on the upward equilibrium, you will stay there. But as soon as you give a perturbation, your controller is not able to asymptotically stabilize the desired configuration. So you will fall either on the left or on the side, or on, on, the, on the right. Okay? Uh, if you increase Kp and you bring it exactly to the value of alpha, it should be strictly larger. Okay. Uh, you see that uh, the profile of the Lyapunov candidate in this section for theta dot equals zero uh, will, uh, will be positive. But again, you have some kind of uh, let's say residual flatness. As soon as you increase beyond the alpha value, so in particular the last plot is for uh, Kp five times alpha, you will see that you have a single isolated minimum at theta desired equal pi. So you, not only our condition will be sufficient, but in this case, by a local analysis at the linear approximation, we can say that in order to guarantee, not only uh, Kp larger than alpha guarantees convergence and asymptotic stability, but it's also necessary, otherwise uh, we could stuck in a, a different configuration. So this was the analysis made on the equation and using the information from the Lyapunov candidate. Let's do some numerical simulation. Let's put some numbers. So for instance, we have, uh, we, we need only two dynamic coefficients, i, the inertia of the link around the joint axis, and we take this value about 1, 0 0.9333, this is coming from some uh, assumption on the structure of the link. And the second number that we need is the product of the mass times the distance uh, of the center of mass from the joint axis times the acceleration 9.81, and uh, you put some number, you get 19.62. You see, you, we don't need to specify more. We don't need to know if the distance is longer and the mass is shorter, or vice versa. It's the whole product that matters. So, this will be also alpha, the minimum possible alpha. Now, if you don't know the mass or the center of mass, but you know the link length, then you can overbound this. I mean, if you assume that the mass... Uh, here, more or less, it could be around 5 kilograms. You say, well, uh, it's not l larger than 10 kilograms, then you double this number. If uh, you don't know if you have a uniform distribution of mass in the link, so you cannot guess that the center of mass is at the half point of the link, but certainly is on the link, so you can overbound D by the link length, which is a kinematic parameter, and so you have an over... Uh, I mean, a conservative value of alpha, which is in increased, which means that if you take a larger Kp, which dominates this conservative alpha, you are guaranteed that everything will work. So this is the way in which, uh, the reasoning which is behind this type of methodology. Now, suppose that, uh, again, you would like to, this simulation is a swing up from rest in the low, lower equilibrium configuration, so the link is downwards, to the upwards configuration with under 80 degrees, so pi, where the gravity is zero. So suppose that we choose uh, now the PD gain, so we don't need to compensate the constant gravity at destination because this is zero. We choose Kp 36 and Kd equal 12. So the P gain satisfy the sufficient condition. 36 is larger than alpha, which is 19.62. And this is the evolution uh, from the position that goes from 0 to 180, as you can see, in about 5 seconds, even less, getting closer. Uh, the velocity, so the theta dot that start from 0 at rest, has a quite a large peak uh, of 
this is degrees per second, not radian per second, so it, this is uh, about 2 pi radian per second, and then goes quite immediately down to zero, uh, and the error that starts with 180 degrees and then goes to zero, and finally the control effort. You can see that uh, there's a large initial torque, about 100 newton meters, for a, uh, a link which is about 5 kilograms. So this is a huge uh, torque in a sense, which is needed only for a few instants of time, no? less than 0.2 seconds, I would say. And then the torque goes down, and at the equilibrium it is zero because we don't need torque to stay uh, in uh, the destination where the gravity is equal to zero. So once the PD term has gone to zero, there's nothing else left. So this simulation shows that things work. Now, suppose that we reduce the gains. In particular, we reduce the Kp gains below the value of alpha. Now, we have shown that by linear approximation, this minimum value is also necessary. So we expect that things will not work. In fact, uh, uh, by the way, I have reduced also the derivative gain because I would like to keep some kind of, uh, um, let's say, no overshooting situation. Mm? So they, they, they are chosen according to some linear analysis, but this is not relevant here. You see that the position starts from zero, but stops at about 120 degrees. So in a local minimum, uh, the velocity has a smaller peak because the gains have been reduced, uh, and then goes to zero, so we stop, and the error uh, also stabilizes at about 60 degrees. Indeed, we have also smaller initial torque, just because we have reduced Kp, and at the initial instant, uh, Kp times the error is, uh, is uh, there's a maximum error, so this is quite large, and um, uh, this is why uh, with a lower Kp you have also a smaller initial torque. So you see that the controller does not work because we have violated the sufficient condition, which in this case are also necessary. So to see that even if you violate the sufficient condition, things may still work. I have a third example here. So now the swing up is not complete, it's not 280 degrees to the upward configuration, but to 90 degrees. At 90 degrees, uh, sine of theta is equal to 1. So in this case, you ha we have a PD plus the constant gravity compensation at the destination, which is simply mg0d. Now, suppose that we use the same gain as before, so 16 and 8. So the Kp is below the minimum value which would guarantee, as a sufficient condition, that the destination uh, is a asymptotic, globally asymptotically stable um, equilibrium. But if you look at the transient behavior, you will see that we go faster to the destination, actually, we go in about one second here, and then we stay there for a while. Uh, the peak of velocity is reduced as, because we are using lower gain. Anyway, and the, there's no residual error. And the uh, initial torque is even smaller because the initial error is only 90 degrees and not 180, so with the same gain we have less torque required by the proportional turn in the control. So you see that we converge despite we have violated the sufficient condition. In fact, in this case, the local linear analysis does not show that uh, choosing a Kp larger than alpha is also necessary. Otherwise, you would have failed, like in the previous case, by using log A. Okay, so uh, what about this new control law? Like with the perfect, uh, say, the cancellation of gravity everywhere, in this case, we have a, uh, an approximate uh, compensation. What happens if this uh, compensation, sorry, is approximate? So we are using g hat of qd. Well, this is, the behavior is kind of 
similar to the case where you're canceling gravity g of q in your controller plus the pd but you're using a, just an estimate of g so a g hat so there's a uh, there will be a close to equilibrium which is different from qd uh, if kb is large enough this will be unique and only if you increase kp to infinity then uh, asymptotically i would say q star approaches qd but of course you cannot use uh, too large gains because there are many practical problems against this type of choice so conclusion of uh, this part is that uh, either you have an accurate knowledge of gravity in which case you can uh, either implement a nonlinear control law which involves cancellation of gravity everywhere or a linear control law which has a constant feed forward turn which compensate gravity only at the destination okay. and in this case uh, uh, you need finite control gains no? positive in the second case large enough but in practice not large otherwise if you have some error you will uh, have also some error in the steady state so what can you do in order to uh, compensate this situation uh, you can resort to uh, another type of control so introduce uh, an additional elementary action which is the integral action we know in linear system that the addition of uh, such control law in particular to a pd but also uh, just to a proportional term so the action of the integral action will eliminate a constant error at steady state if the closed loop system is asymptotically stable uh, in particular when you're doing a step response so for instance in this case when you're uh, starting from some equilibrium you're giving a new qd and this is a step variation of your reference so in this case uh, an integral action would be uh, would solve the problem provided that you guarantee stability asymptotic stability in the closed loop uh, but in robots uh, this is not said there is no proof of this uh, but the idea is uh, maybe this could work even in the nonlinear case huh? in, in particular in presence of an incomplete or no compensation or cancellation of gravity at all so what would uh, this control looks like so the first term is the proportional to the error the last term is the proportional to the derivative of the position error which is just minus q dot because qd is constant and the extra term is proportional with a third gain ki remember that all these terms are vector of matrices of the integral so of the story of the position error from the initial time where you start the experiment to the current time t okay now uh, this type of control law has a lot of advantages so it's independent from any robot dynamic model term. it's a kind of a general purpose controller uh, regulator of this kind by the way are available on the market for any automation system so you could uh, adapt this type of rules controller or uh, hardware and software also to your robot However, uh, so if this works, uh, if this works, so if you guarantee that a steady state, uh, I mean, the, that you have a, a, an asymptotically stable equilibrium at the desired configuration, then Q dot will go to zero. Uh, the uh, position error will go to zero. So the first and last term will vanish. And what about the interval? From that instant where everything works, the error will go zero. So the, uh, you will not integrate any longer new inputs. But of course, the integral has accumulated this error, so at steady state has reached a value. And by definition, I would say, the integral 
at steady state of the story of the error, so from between zero and a generic infinite time, it means large enough, multiplied by Ki, will need to compensate the gravity at the destination. So we know that this is necessary in order to have an equilibrium in the closed loop. So you're not compensating or canceling gravity, but the integral term learns by itself this type of action at uh, the destination. Okay, so this is a very interesting interpretation, especially in robotics. Now, what is missing here? It's missing that we have to show asymptotic stability of this control law, so the uniqueness of the equilibrium, the desired equilibrium in the closed loop, and this is quite complex to achieve. It's only a local result, which means that we need to start close uh, in, a, in a neighbor of the uh, configuration QD with zero velocity or with very small velocity. And we have a, a number of conditions on, uh, on, uh, on the gains, which involves uh, all the gains together and also the initial error. So it's quite hard to find combination that works in this case. Still, uh, we may look at what happens uh, nominally. So I have here a, a very simple example. It's not a robot, it could be more an elevator, but in fact it's a mechanical system with one degree of freedom, which has a linear dynamics. So here on the picture you see a mass, which is hold in position by two vertical uh, bars, you can apply force, control force F, the position of the mass going up is um, characterized by a, a coordinate Q, and you have the gravity acting in the opposite direction. So, uh, if we write the dynamics in this, and we assume that friction is not there, we have the mass times the acceleration equal uh, F minus the gravity force, so the gravity force can be brought to the other side, it's constant in this case, is m times g0. Uh, notice that we could have find this equation, which is very simple, I would say, over simple, also applying the Lagrange method. So we would have built the kinetic energy, one half m q dot square, we would have built the potential energy, which is uh, um, would be minus m g0 with its own direction times q, the more q, the higher q, the higher is the potential energy, but since the g0 has the negative uh, direction, then the minus would be cancelled, so uh, we would have just m g0 q, and its gradient is exactly m g0 as constant, so the gradient with respect to q. So this is the model in the absence of friction. So what type of controller could we impose if we would like to bring the mass at a certain height QD? So in this sense I'm uh, saying that this is kind of a, an elevator. So first of all we define, we define the error, so QD is constant, QD minus Q of T, and the derivative of the error, which is minus QT dot. Uh, let's start with the PD controller. Now, PD controller, if you apply this and find the steady state condition when Q dot is zero and Q double dot is zero, you will have certainly a steady state error, which is QD minus Q bar, so you reach a Q bar height, uh, which can be computed from the, this balance equation, it's just QD minus mg zero over KP, so with KP large, you can reduce the error, uh, the more the mass of this uh, elevator, I like would say, the larger will be the error, while G0 remains constant. And with the sign, you see that you will reach, because you're working against gravity, you will reach a lower height in general. Okay? Always, actually. So, uh, you can apply uh, a PD control plus compensation at the destination. Now, uh, this is also equal to cancellation, in fact, because uh, the gravity term uh, is constant. So, cancelling it uh, now uh, and, and ever, or 
compensating it just at destination, starting from now, is exactly the same thing. So this is, can be classified as the PD control with gravity cancellation, and this will regulate, so we'll reach zero error with zero velocity at steady state for any choice of KP and KB. Well, what about, but uh, indeed you, you need to know here the mass of this device, so uh, otherwise you would have an approximation. So if you would want to get rid completely of the um, uh, of the, this information, of the dynamic information about your system, you resort to a PID controller, and this is the full version. And you can show quite easily that this uh, globally no, regulates the system, in fact, exponentially, because this is a linear system and the PID is also a combination of linear action, so everything re remains linear, so that uh, asymptotic and exponential stability are the same, since there's a unique equilibrium, this will be a global uh, property, is obtained if you choose uh, the gains positive, but in particular there's an equality between the three, the, second, the last uh, equation here, that says that Kp should be larger than the product of the mass times Ki divided by Kd. So some information on the mass should be given, so an upper bound, so that this would lower bound the positive gain Kp. Indeed, you can reduce this lower bound by increasing Kd or by decreasing Ki, but you cannot eliminate Ki, otherwise uh, you would violate this necessary and sufficient condition for stability. These are both necessary and sufficient because the system is linear, in fact. Uh, how do you get to this uh, condition? Well, you can do a Laplace domain analysis, so you can transfer, uh, Laplace transfer the error, which is the quantity that you want to bring to zero, and you can uh, uh, treat the presence of uh, gravity as a disturbance. So you take the Laplace transform of this constant term, which is just the constant expression, and you call this D as a disturbance. So, first of all, we find the transfer function between the disturbance and the error. We see what is the effect of this on the, on the, uh, uh, on the position, both in transient and at steady state. And if we do this, and we transfer the expression of a PID in the Laplace domain, and same for the closed loop dynamics, uh, it's quite simple to see that the integral term as a term 1 over s, uh, the Laplace transform of m q double dot as a factor m s squared. So if you normalize thing and you multiply by s uh, your equation, and then you isolate uh, the ratio e over ds, you end up with a closed loop transfer function w of s, which takes this form. 1 over ms cubed plus kds squared plus kps plus ki. So there's no zeros in this transfer function. There are three poles. Uh, in order that you have asymptotic stability, these three poles should all be with uh, a negative real part in the complex plane. And in order to check not the value but where they are, so a very general conclusion without putting numbers, you can use the route criterion. So you can build the route table associated to this third order polynomial and construct the full table, which will have four rows because this is a, a third order polynomial, and then look at the sign of the first columns. And the route table uh, will take this form. On the first row, you put in order the um, odd uh, coefficients of the polynomial, so m for the third order term and kp for the first order term. In the second row, you put the, uh, in decreasing order the coefficients of the even terms, so kd for s square and ki for uh, the s0, so the constant term. And then you build the, the remaining two rows of the table and the 
first element is a kind of a determinant of what is above, but with opposite terms, so it's KD times KP, uh, so the off diagonal, uh, minus MKI, and then you divide by the element which is above, so by KD, and you uh, do the same for uh, the other terms, and in fact the KI in the last row uh, follows from the KI in the row 2, uh, with a motion like the uh, horse in the chess uh, table. So uh, these are the four elements. So the mass M is positive, KD should be taken as positive, KI should be taken as positive, so there should be no changes of sign in the first row, so that all uh, roots will be, no matter which are the values, the numerical values will be in the left hand side of the complex plane so that you have uh, stability, asymptotic stability. And the last condition is that the element in row uh, labeled as 1 should be positive and this gives exactly the inequality that we have seen before. So uh, in this simple case PID uh, should, uh, will work and you see that you have already some condition which relates the gain to each other. You have no condition on the locality because this is a linear system, the general robot will not be such, and also no relation between the initial error and the gains. In order to get rid of this, in fact, more in general, um, there has been a lot of work over the years on, on this type of uh, techniques, and finally somebody has introduced a non-linear version of the PID law. So again, uh, a controller which is fully independent from the uh, from the model, from the dynamic model terms, uh, which has a proportional and a derivative term which is exactly the same. Now in the integral term, the only difference is that the error is not integrated as such, but you will have a saturation of the error. So you can use here one of many possible saturation type functions which are bounded. Uh, for instance, here I show you two of them, which taken the, given the error at a certain time, will uh, take it as such if this is small enough, otherwise it will saturate both in the positive and in the negative so this kind of saturation is uh, strange, but in fact avoids that during the transient you will have accumulation of uh, error in the integral term which tends to destabilize the behavior. And we will see uh, more on that. Now, uh, I don't present the proof which is very complex and also uh, uh, the bounds that are needed on or are sufficient for KP, KI, and KD uh, in order to guarantee uh, global asymptotic stability are quite uh, involved. If you're interested, the paper by Raphael Kelly on the transaction of automatic control in 1998, which proved for the first time uh, this nice result, is available in the extra material on the course website. Now, I would uh, stop now for a while and then we will conclude with the last uh, few slides.